Got it.
Sit down and he can lob over me out. I get, could I get everybody to take your seat, please? We're about ready to start. Ladies and gentlemen, please, if you would, take your seats and could we close the doors to go ahead and begin. I want to welcome everybody to the uh, annual Georgia Tech Institute address. My name is Michael Warden and I'm the Vice President for Institute Communication. So in addition to those of us that are here in this virtually standing room only auditorium, we have an overflow room just next door here in Clough Commons, as well as those uh, who will be viewing the address live on Google Hangout, where we're live streaming this right now and we'll later archive it on our uh, Georgia Tech YouTube channel for viewing later. After the President's uh, update, there's going to be an opportunity for those of you here uh, in, in person to ask questions. We've also asked for questions to be submitted in advance, and I have several of those that have been submitted before. And so uh, I will call on you after the President has finished his address, and we will get microphones out to you. So please wait for the microphone to ask your question, but when you're asked to raise your hand to be uh, recognized. Before we start, I'd like to welcome all of our guests that are here with us today, and we'll uh, recognize a few of those individually here in just a moment. But I would first personally like to recognize the First Lady of Georgia Tech, Val Peterson. Thank you, Val. Uh, so now we're ready for the main act. Uh, and in his five years here at Georgia Tech, President G.P. Bud Peterson has championed efforts to strengthen the Institute's national leadership position in innovation, expanded our strategic partnerships, and worked to maximize Georgia Tech's impact on the state, the region, the nation, and the world. And in the process, both he and Val have toured Georgia each and every summer that they've been here, covering more than 4,000 miles, visiting friends, alumni, and state leadership in 34 cities and nearly every county throughout the state of Georgia. In addition, you might also be interested to know about him that he's made an estimated 625 speeches and presentations as president of Georgia Tech. He's shaken hands with 32,000 graduates who have crossed the commencement stage while he's been president here. And he's posed for thousands of selfies with grads, parents, <laughs> and families. He has not quite gotten up to Ellen DeGeneres' record yet, but he's working on it. <laughs> In his first year here as Georgia Tech as our best dressed president, he inaugurated Georgia Tech's challenge course by zip lining in suit and tie. <laughs> and just last week, he accepted the ice bucket challenge from Georgia State's President Mark Becker by highlighting the ALS research that's being done here at Georgia Tech uh, by Dr. Cassie Mitchell before being doused with four buckets of water and one full bucket of ice from courtesy of Buzz. Also, while wearing his trademark suit and tie. <laughs> and in case you missed that, you can also watch that session on the Georgia Tech YouTube channel as well. And uh, I think you're still waiting for George P. Burdell to answer your challenge. For yes, the I am. Okay, well, we're still waiting for that one, and we'll try to have video of that for you as well. Uh, and uh, uh, lastly, he's worn an estimated 47 different gold ties <laughs> to hundreds of events 
all of them serving as our chief ambassador and the Ice Challenge Grandmaster of Georgia Tech. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Georgia Tech's 11th president, Bud Peterson. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. I, I don't know, am I on? Uh, thank you, Michael. I don't know where you get this stuff. <laughs> uh, I want to welcome all of you, those here in the room, those that are watching on the web, and uh, I want to start off by introducing some of the leadership team uh, here at Georgia Tech. I'll ask that they stand, but please hold your applause. There's a few of them, uh, and we'll try to go through this first. Our Provost and Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dr. Raphael Bras, uh, Mr. Barrett Carson, Vice President for Development. Uh, Dr. Susan Cousins, who's the uh, Vice Provost for Graduate Affairs and Graduate and Faculty Affairs. Um, Dr. Stephen Cross, Executive Vice President for Research. Ms. Lynn Durham, Chief of Staff and Assistant Vice President. Uh, Dr. Archie Irvin, Vice President for Institute Diversity. Mr. Pat McKenna, who's Chief Legal Counsel. Um, Dr. Colin Potts, Vice Provost for Undergraduate Affairs. Mr. Dr. Bill Schaefer, Vice President for Student Affairs. Mr. Dean Sheehan, who's uh, Vice President for Government Community Affairs. And you've met Vice President Michael Warden. Uh, some of our academic deans that are with us, Dr. our newest dean, Dr. Miriam Alave from the Scheller College of Business. Uh, Dr. Stephen French from the College of Architecture. And at the end, uh, Dr. Zvi Galil from the College of Computing, uh, Dr. Paul Goldbart from the College of Sciences, Dr. Jacqueline Jane Jones Royster from the Ivan Allen College of Liberal Arts, and Dr. Catherine Murray Rust from Dean of the Libraries, uh, and then three others that are with us, Dr. Gary May uh, from the College of Engineering, how can you forget engineering, um, uh, Mr. Joe Irwin who's with the uh, President of the Alumni Association down here, uh, Mr. Mike Babinski, who's the Director of Athletics, and Mr. Al Trujillo, who's the President of the Georgia Tech Foundation. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> this uh, event today is part of our ongoing commitment to communications to try to help you understand some of the things that are going on at Georgia Tech, some of the things we've accomplished over the last year, and some of the things that we hope to accomplish over the next year. This is a busy, vibrant, and complicated campus, and it'd be awfully difficult for me to do a comprehensive review of everything that's going on here at Georgia Tech in just a short few minutes, but I'll try to cover as much as I can. Five years ago, five and a half years ago when I came, I was new, I was talking to a lot of people, and I remember thinking that I wish, I can't wait till I've been here a year or a year and a half, and then I'll know everything that's going on at Georgia Tech. Uh, but there is so much going on that I actually think I'm losing ground. Uh, I know a smaller percentage today than I did when I first came. Uh, but there's a tremendous amount going on here at uh, Georgia Tech. The uh, um, activities involving faculty, students, and staff uh, expand it, or span a tremendous uh, breadth of, of uh, knowledge, a tremendous breadth of activities, and a tremendous breadth of the types of people that are involved. As a public research university, we're a laboratory of innovation. We not only invent new tools and design new processes, but we also prepare the next generation of leaders. And that's probably the most important thing we do as a, as a university. Georgia Tech is making its reputation known. It's becoming better and better known worldwide through our global presence, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we go on. Probably the best place to start is our freshman class. For the sixth year in a row, we've got the best qualified, most diverse freshman class, class in Georgia Tech history. It's an outstanding class, and you can see some of the statistics here. At the uh, freshman convocation a week ago last Sunday, I announced that this year's freshman class had 39% women, up from 30% about a year ago. And at, at the convocation, I'm not sure who clapped louder, the women or the men, uh, but everybody was happy about that. Uh, next year, we're shooting for 40%, but our diversity in terms of underrepresented minorities, women, has been increasing and continues to increase. It's a focus of what we're trying to do to make sure that every student from Georgia, around the country, or around the world that wants to attend Georgia Tech can, in fact, attend. The, uh, over the past five years, we've had... Uh, 
we've seen a tremendous increase in the, in the quality of the students and a tremendous increase in the number of applications. Applications have gone up from about 11,400 to almost 26,000 for the 2,800 spots. The freshmen have impressive academic credentials, but the thing that the admissions folks really look at, I mean, when your average GPA is 394 and the average SAT is over 1,400, then it's hard to differentiate the quality of students. But what the admissions folks are looking at is to try and understand what is their involvement in uh, service activities. What are they doing with respect to their communities? What are they doing to uh, in their high schools? Are they in student government? Are they in debate or the band or athletics? And those are the types of students that we're looking for, students that can make a difference. Because those are the types of students that will come to Georgia Tech that are not only very, very smart, but are very, very engaged. And they'll help to change the world. As Michael mentioned, in the past five years, we've graduated 32,000 students. Um, that is about 18% of the 180,000 students that have ever graduated from Georgia Tech, and about 23% of the 140,000 living alums. So the numbers of students that we are graduating today are going to have an increasingly large impact on society and the world and the, the venues where they are encountering other people and working to try to improve the human condition. Uh, faculty, over the past five years, we've seen a tremendous growth in our faculty. We've created 123 new tenured or tenure track faculty positions. That's entirely new, fully funded positions, about $14 million uh, spent on that. Since 1993, 1995, when the NSF Career Award Program was established, Georgia Tech has had 192 career award recipients. That's one of the highest totals in the country. And 75 of those, 73 of those, have been in just the past three years. Our faculty continue to excel in research. They continue to excel in development of new educational techniques and continue to excel in a whole host of areas. We're one of the world's most globalized technological research universities. We have collaborations with more than 80 countries and partnerships, institutional partnerships with 30. Uh, just recently, in partnership with Tianjin University in China, we became a member of the Shenzhen Virtual University Park, and we established a new Master of Science in Electrical and Computer Engineering in Shenzhen. Our global partnerships ex expand beyond a number of areas. This particular one uh, took place at our campus in France, in Metz, France, when we opened the Lafayette Institute, or Institute Lafayette. It's an institute a research institute that's focused on nanotechnology and developing new types of technologies for our researchers there at our campus in France. We don't offer any undergraduate programs in our, in our campus in France, but we do have full-time masters and graduate students. And this new facility will provide the resources and the uh, equipment that they need to make leading-edge breakthroughs. Uh, you, this last picture here looks a little odd because the only two people that are, have their hand over their hearts is Bernard and I. Uh, they're, playing, they're actually playing the Star Spangled Banner. So they played the French nas National Anthem first and then the Star Spangled Banner. But that kind of explains why we're <laughs> both standing there. And everybody else is like this. Um, if you haven't, and I know most of you probably haven't visited the campus in France, but what a great facility that is for us. What a great experience for our students. The uh, global opportunities that we present. We currently have set students studying in 70 countries around the world. 46% of our undergraduate students participate in some sort of meaningful undergraduate experience while they're here at Georgia Tech, either a study abroad or a work abroad, 46%. That's a huge percentage. Most public universities are in the range of 5 to 10%. But we have students that are globally engaged and have gotten a critical mass of students so that the word is spreading among the students when they come here as freshmen, they start talking about where are they going to go on their study abroad. And when I talk to students at commencement and ask them what's the most meaningful uh, thing that you participated in or experienced at Georgia Tech, it's hardly ever that Calculus II course. Uh, it's almost always co-op or internship or study abroad. Uh, when I talk to the parents about what's the most meaningful thing they're son or daughter did here at Georgia Tech, they almost always say study abroad because they get to go over and visit them uh, while they're over there. But the value goes way beyond academics. Uh, the students uh, that come back, uh, when I used to think about study abroad programs, I thought that employers want to see students that study abroad because they want students that have experienced another culture and can speak another language. I was wrong. What happens to these young people when they study abroad is they go into a very, very different environment 
they find out they can succeed. It builds their confidence, they realize there's a whole big world out there, and they get to do things that they probably wouldn't have ever been able to do otherwise. Great example is this past summer we traveled to Europe. We started a development office in Europe, uh, and the headquarters is actually in Brussels, Belgium. Uh, we also started one in China with the headquarters in, Sh in Shanghai, but we visited uh, our office in Brussels and traveled to Belgium. One of the things we did while we were at Belgium was to visit the supreme headquarters of allied powers of Europe. That is the NATO headquarters for Europe. It turns out that the head of NATO forces in Europe is always a U.S. general, a four-star general, and at this current time it's General Philip Breedlove, who's a Georgia Tech alum, civil engineering, class of 1977. He arranged for 25 students from the Sam Nunn School of International Affairs to visit the NATO headquarters. It turns out that when General Breedlove was at Georgia Tech as a student in civil engineering, he had a roommate, uh, Admiral Sandy Winnefeld, who was civil engineering class of 1978, and Admiral Winnefeld is vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Now that's pretty cool. Uh, these two guys were roommates. One's the vice chair of uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff. One is the head of NATO forces in Europe. But General Breedlove stood and answered questions with these 25 students for about an hour and a half. Uh, and was tremendously impressed. Val and I were fortunate enough to be able to stay in his chateau. Uh, they give the head of NATO forces a sh French chateau that's about 200 years old uh, for a dollar a year. It's a pretty good deal. Uh, pretty nice place. We were able to stay there and I got up early the next morning and talked to the general and uh, talked to him about whether or not we could arrange an opportunity for some of our students to visit the uh, uh, to visit the beaches of Normandy to participate in the 70th anniversary of the D-Day landing. And it turned out that if you're a four-star general, you've got a lieutenant colonel, uh, and that lieutenant colonel makes things happen. And the lieutenant colonel also was a Georgia Tech alum, kind of like... <laughs> kind of like Lynn Durham that makes things happen in our office. But, uh, so they arranged for 240 students to ride a bus for 15 hours from our campus in Metz, France to go to the beaches in Normandy on, and celebrate the 70th anniversary of the D-Day invasion. And you can think about that and what kind of experience that is and how meaningful that will be to those young people. So these global experiences, just a tremendous, tremendous opportunity for our students. Uh, you're all familiar with the uh, Strategic plan that we developed, started it about five years ago, actually five years ago this month, finished it about a year later. Uh, we've established a strategic planning process, uh, or a strategic planning advisory group. They are focused on trying to develop the processes by which we implement many of the activities in the strategic plan. We are making tremendous progress, and a lot of what you see in this presentation, a lot of what you see going on around you is the result of that strategic planning process. David Frost, uh, Dr. David Frost from Civil Engineering is chairing that group, and they're providing a great resource for us uh, within the leadership team to try to understand where should we focus, what should we focus on, where should we uh, apply resources. There are so many things that we're doing. Trying to be selective about what would have the greatest impact uh, is, a very, is a little difficult, but this group is helping us to do that. Uh, the strategic plan goals. Uh, we had a leadership offsite at the Academy of Medicine a couple of weeks ago with 40 or 50 people from around the campus. Uh, we talked about the strategic plan but tried to focus on what it was that we wanted to accomplish in the next five to ten years um, and had a discussion. Uh, Mr. Swant, uh, Dr. Bross, Dr. Cross made presentations about their thoughts and they had some different thoughts. But we tried to come together, discuss that, coalesce it, and then place some of the key initiatives in uh, and relate them to each of the key five key goals in our strategic plan. With respect to goal one, uh, we've made market improvements in almost every area. We want to differentiate the undergraduate education here at Georgia Tech. Uh, we want to figure out how we can and what we need to do to be among the most highly respected undergraduate, or undergraduate and graduate learning institutions in the country. Goal two, we want to continue our research strategy derived from the strategic plan and involves the entire Georgia Institute. We've identified 12 core areas and are trying to focus on those 12 core areas and identify the global challenges and find researchers who are interested and students who are interested in trying to address those global challenges. We're going to diversify and strengthen research, pursue transformative research, strengthen collaborative or par partnerships, and I'll talk about that a little bit more, and lead in targeted reputational areas. Really four important questions that we have to think about in the strategic planning process. 
where do we have a national or international reputation? And what do we need to do to improve and retain it? Where do we have an opportunity for a national or international reputation? And what do we need to do to achieve it? What are the core areas that we simply must be engaged in? What are the things that we must do to be one of the leading technological research institutions in the country? And number four, what are we willing to stop doing so that we can accomplish the first three? And those are some challenging questions, but things that we have to do as part of the strategic plan. Goal three, we want to significantly expand Georgia Tech's leadership position uh, in innovation. It's a thing that drives our innovation uh, initiatives in Tech Park or in Tech Square, it drives our undergraduate student innovation initiatives in many of the things that we do. We want to expand the regional innovation system that Georgia Tech has. And I'll talk a little bit about, more about GTRI, I'm sorry, uh, about uh, uh, ATDC, the Advanced Technology Development Center, and EI squared in a few minutes. Goal four, we want to expand the world footprint of Georgia Tech. When I came, when Wayne Clough started as president at Georgia Tech in the early 90s, I think his challenge was to take a pretty good regional university and create a national, nationally recognized university, and he did that. I think when I came that the goal was to try to take a very, very fine, nationally recognized institution and help make it globally recognized. And we are working very, very hard to do that. We're going to continue to, to uh, um, try to create additional international partnerships for both our students and our faculty. Part of the reason we established development office in Asia and one in Europe is to try to expand our interaction with global companies that are located outside of the U.S. And we'll continue to pursue those global partnerships to the best of our ability. And finally, goal, four, goal five, which is the one that makes the first four possible, and that's to pursue, relentlessly pursue institutional effectiveness. Uh, we have made a number of changes in the way we do business at Georgia Tech. Uh, that has, in many cases, dramatically improved the institutional effectiveness. Most of those have gone very well. Some of them have had a few rough spots that we've had to work through. But those have allowed us to transition resources or divert resources from one area that used to, used to uh, require a lot of resources to start other new initiatives, and we'll continue along those lines. Interdisciplinary research continues to be a very, very important part of what we do. We have uh, outstanding research in a number of areas. In the area of energy, the new Carbon Neutral Energy Solutions Building, which is out on North Avenue in the North, area, North Avenue research area, will help us look at new solutions. Uh, for energy, the energy issues that we face as a country and within the world. We're focused in areas um, of additive manufacturing. And you'll see an example of that a little bit later on today in my presentation. Uh, we've submitted several federal proposals to establish large manufacturing centers. And just recently, the Georgia Manufacturing Extension Partnership was awarded a grant to develop and pilot a Southeastern Manufacturing Technology Center, which will help to expand and increase the manufacturing in the Southeastern United States. In the area of um, cybersecurity, we've done a number of things in cybersecurity that are quite impressive. Uh, we had a visit from Secretary Penny Prisker from the Department of Commerce a number earlier last year that came down to see what we're doing in cybersecurity. I'm sorry, it was J, uh, Jay Johnson from Homeland Security that came down to see what we were doing in cybersecurity. And finally, in biomedicine, the biotechnology area, some really remarkable things that are going on. Just two examples, uh, Dr. Ravi Belamkanda uh, is doing some work on nano scaffolding. There's a type of brain tumor that has a tendency to grow along neural networks in the brain or along capillary structures. He's developed a nano scaffolding device that is preferential growth for these tumors. So you use this nano scaffolding device and put it in the brain and you can actually direct the direction of growth of the tumors to have it migrate out to the surface of the skull where it can be removed. One of our faculty members, um, uh, Dr. Shunan Ni, nee, who's in the biomedical engineering program, has developed a process whereby nanoparticles of gold are coated with a, with a Raman uh, coating and they are injected in the body. They have a tendency to coalesce and congregate in the cancerous tumor. Then you can use a handheld Raman scanner device to outline the boundaries of the tumor so that during surgery you can more clearly define exactly where the tumor is and where its boundaries are and make sure that the entire tumor is, is uh, removed. Some amazing things going on in our research areas. 
The research strategy is really focused on collaborations. We've got a number of collaborations. Probably the most, the one you've heard most about recently is a $20 million partnership with Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, a partnership to improve pediatric healthcare. There is a recognition today that children are not just small people. Uh, and I know that sounds a little funny, but all of the medical devices, uh, all of the prescriptions are typically made for adult males. And they don't work very well for children, particularly premature babies. A good example is a kidney dialysis machine. You cannot tr turn the flow volume down low enough on a kidney dialysis machine to keep a small child from becoming dehydrated. And so we've got folks that are working with Children's Health Care of Atlanta to improve pediatric health care across the state and around the world. Another great project that's going on is one in Gainesville, Georgia. You think, Gainesville, Georgia, what could we be doing there? We've got a program up there where we gave women that had breast cancer, gave 70 women that had breast cancer an iPad. They communicate with their physician. They exchange information about their treatment. They're very invested very involved, they take courses on their treatment, and they know a lot about what's going on. We went up and met with them, talked with a number of those women, and they are so thankful and so impressed with this technology and how it helps them understand the impact of their treatment. One woman will say, well, I was taking this medication and, and this happened, and another one will say, well, that's been happening to me. So they can share that information in a very quiet, very, very close-knit uh, structure with physician oversight, so the doctors, the physicians can read these messages, can interact with them through the iPad, and it's making a tremendous difference in the lives and the health of these 70 women. We are working on an innovation system. I mentioned that earlier. We continue to try to expand the innovation system in TechSquare. Um, it has become a very, very vibrant zone, and those of you that were here 12 years ago or 10 years ago, uh, re remember what that portion of of uh, Midtown Atlanta was like. I was not here, but people tell me that it was not a place that you wanted to go. It's not a place that you wanted to spend a lot of time, and it's a vibrant, exciting place today with new companies moving in every day. Panasonic, EY is there, NCR is over in Tech Square, uh, Penguin Computing is there. Uh, last year, AT&T Mobility set up their fourth innovation center in the world in Tech Square. They've created a partnership. These two young men are actually innovation interns for AT&T Mobility. So they're two of our students that are spending time over in their foundry, their innovation center, uh, to try to help AT&T identify and develop new mobile applications. Most recently, just last week, Home Depot announced that they were going to create or establish an inno innovation center uh, in the Synergy building uh, in Tech Square. So it's a vibrant, thriving, exciting place. We're doing everything we can to nurture startups. EI Squared, which is the Enterprise Innovation Institute under the direction of Stephen Fleming down here in front, has helped 1,770 Georgia manufacturing companies reduce operating costs by over $36 million and increase sales by $191 million, creating 950 jobs. This is having a tremendous impact on the state of Georgia and the, uh, uh, the employment and economy. In the past year, ATDC uh, has... Uh, the ATDC program companies, these are companies that have gone through ATDC and are now, uh, some of them are still in ATDC, some of them have graduated out. They report revenues more than $1.3 billion and more than 5,500 jobs created by these ATDC companies. So we are working hard to nurture those startups. And we're working hard to invest and engage our students through a number of activities. The Capstone Design Project, probably the one that you are most familiar with, is the Inventure Prize a prize where students come together and compete with each other. The eight finalists, typically over in the first center, uh, go through a thing that's very much like um, American Idol. This year's winners, three young women, uh, they developed what's uh, uh, a sanitary toilet for the 2.6 billion people that don't have sanitary toilet facilities. Uh, they spent some time in China with a the manufacturer. They spent some time in Kenya this past summer trying to get the country of Kenya to adopt their device, and they are changing the world through their innovations. The, uh, 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 we're expanding those, uh, that innovation, that concept of innovation, into the way we approach learning. You've probably heard, unless you've been on another planet, about the uh, online master's program that uses the MOOC format. We have 2,000 students in that program today. It's a program where students can get a master's of science degree in computer science for under $7,000. It's going very, 
very well. AT&T helped us. They gave a $2 million gift to help us get the program off the ground. Um, and uh, we're using some of the information and the knowledge that we've gained through that program and the other MOOCs that we've teach to impact the on-campus learning through a flipped classroom approach. When I went to school, um, I went to the lecture, wrote down notes as fast as I could while the professor wrote with one hand and erased with the other, and uh, tried to write things down, and then went to the library with a bunch of my friends, my classmates, to figure out what it was that they just said. Uh, today, the students watch the lectures in many of our classes, watch lectures before they come to class, and then they go to class and actually have some discussions, work problems, talk to the faculty member, talk to the uh, the teaching assistants. It dramatically improves the way we approach education. Service learning continues to be a big part of what we're doing and a focus on global challenges uh, here at Georgia Tech. 17% of uh, the master's students that are 17 percent of the students in the master's program today are in the massive online uh, computer science program that I just talked about. I mentioned that one of the things that differentiates what students we admit to Georgia Tech uh, is their involvement and engagement in other activities, their leadership activities, their involvement in student organizations and service activities. Uh, we've got a number of those types of organizations here at Georgia Tech. We want students who are engaged, engaged in the more than 400 student activities, students that are going to interact with their faculty members and challenge their faculty members and interact with each other and challenge each other. You know, at universities we do, about, we do three things. We do a lot of things, but fundamentally we do three things. There's the student to professor interaction, uh, which we've been doing for 35 years through our uh, uh, pro uh, professional education program. Uh, we were sending VHS tapes, and in fact at one time Georgia Tech spent, sent the beta format videotapes for those of you that can remember those. So we've been doing that for a long time. The student to student interaction, and I think one of the reasons we're seeing this explosion of the massive open, open online courses is because the students today are so comfortable with social media, so comfortable with exchanging information and communicating via social media that that has really allowed this student to student interaction in the MOOC format types of courses to really take off. But the third thing that we do is what I think of as the other education, uh, where students come to us, come to many of you, they learn how to interact with people. They learn how to become the people that they will become for the rest of their lives. And I'm not sure how you do that online, uh, but that's something that we can offer and something that we need to focus on. People ask me if I think Institutions like Georgia Tech are going to still be around in 20 years, and I think the answer is yes. And the reason the answer is yes is because of that third component. All of the other things that students learn when they went to college. They grow up, they mature here, and they learn to be the people that they'll be for the rest of their lives. We're involved in the community. You may have heard about the recent announcement with the Atlanta Public Schools. Dr. Maria Karstarfen came over with her leadership team, visited with some of us, and we came to an agreement where we would admit the valedictorian and salutatorian of all 11 of the Atlanta Public School uh, high schools, uh, and that we would meet their tuition, uh, we would uh, meet their tuition needs. Our goal is actually to meet all of their need-based financial needs. Today, Georgia Tech spends 50, it's 50 $50 million a year on need-based financial aid. But that only covers about 60% of the total need-based aid that our students have. Um, but we're really pleased with this uh, program with APS, excited about where it's going. Uh, we've got a number of other uh, projects that our students are involved in, in some of the community centers that the mayor has reopened every community center in the uh, uh, voluntary in schools. We had a great event just two years ago, the Centennial Place Elementary School, which is just across North Avenue. We had the first three, we had three students, and they were the first students that started school at Centennial Place Elementary and matriculated into Georgia Tech. And we're going to try to continue to attract the best students from places around the country, but also from right here at home with the Atlanta Public School System. Athletics, um, very important. I often say that athletics is the lens through which most people or many people view Georgia Tech. It's about a $75 million enterprise, pardon me, a $75 million business in a $1.5 billion enterprise, but has a, an impact on the institution that far outweighs the financial impact. We've got tremendous student athletes at Georgia Tech. 
We have 365 athletes that serve as ambassadors for this institution. Their average grade point over all the student athletes is a 3-0. They graduate uh, 90, or I'm sorry, 79 percent graduate within six years, which is very close to the total institutional average of 82 percent. Um, four of the teams, football, golf, women's tennis, and men's swimming, had were in the top 10 percent in the APR, that's the academic uh, progress rate, and eight of the 17 varsity teams had a perfect 1,000 on the uh, APR this past year, including golf, which has had a perfect 1,000 score for every year that the APR has been in, uh, in place. It's about since 2003, it's had a perfect score every year. So we've got tremendous student athletes at Georgia Tech, and we're proud of them, proud of the program, and proud of what's going to happen on Saturday. <laughs> Our graduates are in great demand. Uh, when I go uh, to graduation, I talk to the students. We also run some surveys with our students about whether or not they've been able to find a job. The survey from this last May indicated that 68 percent of the graduates had a job when they walked across the stage at commencement. 22 percent were going on to law school, medical school, pharmacology, uh, or professional school. And the last 10 percent, when I talk to those students and ask them if they've got a job, they say, no. I said, well, yeah, have you been looking? Most of them just say, no, I was just trying to get out of here. <laughs> um, <laughs> some of them decide to travel a little bit before they go to work, but they're in very, very high demand. You see some of the uh, uh, statistics there on salaries. Probably the most interesting thing from that survey was that 91 percent of the students actually agreed that calculus helped them in their first job. Um, so we're uh, excited about that. Uh, Cleary Act alert this morning, you probably saw that, uh, two robberies on campus in the past 24 hours. We're continuing to focus on health and safety. Um, we're taking aggressive steps to prevent sexual violence. Lynn Durham just recently chaired a task force on sexual violence. They came forward with a report. We had previously had a task force on mental health, and one of the things in their report uh, was to create a wellness initiative. So we are currently looking at establishing a wellness initiative here at Georgia Tech that would, that would include the Stamps Health Center, the CRC, um, the Counseling Center, and a number of other organizations across campus to look at emotional health, physical health, um, uh, and kind of cover the whole spectrum of wellness for our students. And we expect to have that report back within 60 to 90 days and start down that path. We've actually made a lot of progress on the mental health uh, recommendations already. The Sexual Violence Prevention Task Force, just uh, I met with them about a week or two ago. We got that report and we're working through that to try to understand how to bring some of these different organizations that are working in different areas that have to do with health of our students, our faculty, and our staff together under a united uh, banner in a way that can be most effective for our students, faculty, and staff. You've probably heard that we are a tobacco-free campus. The Board of Regents passed a ruling in March that all 31 institutions would be tobacco-free. Not smoke-free, but tobacco-free. So that includes um, uh, Red Man, Skull, e-cigarettes, you name it. Uh, it's tobacco-free. That'll be a challenge for us, and it's going to be a challenge that requires that all of us respect the rights of others uh, and try to move forward in a positive and productive fashion. Um, we've got a number of programs for those individuals that choose to smoke and want to try to stop. We have a number of cessation programs, and we're trying to work with those individuals that choose to smoke and don't want to stop. We're trying to work with them and, and find a way that we can balance this whole issue of a tobacco-free campus. It is really an effort and an initiative that's aimed again at the wellness of our students, our faculty, and staff. The issue of crime on campus, uh, I have, uh, uh, we printed out a number of uh, some of these flyers that you can pick one up on the way out. It talks about some of the initiatives, the safety initiatives here on campus. We continue to be concerned, continue to partner with the uh, Atlanta Pub Police Department, with the State Patrol, with Midtown Blue, which is the private security force in Midtown, and continue to work with them to try to ensure that we have as safe a cam campus as possible. Crime is down since 2010. The number of uh, uh, burglaries has gone from 42 to 19. The number of robberies is down from 5 to 4. And when I say 5 to 4, you say, well, how can there only be 4? We have a very aggressive a very aggressive uh, program with respect to clear the Cleary Act. 
So June Cleary was a student at Lehigh University, and in the early 90s, she was killed. And her parents felt like if they had, if she had been alerted to what happened, uh, what was happening on that campus, that that might have been avoidable. So the federal government enacted the Cleary Act, which says that each campus, each university has to identify what they call a Cleary zone. And they have to report to students, faculty, staff, to the campus community, any criminal activity that occurs in that Cleary zone. We are very, very aggressive in identifying our Cleary Zone. It goes from Centennial Olympic Park down here, up here past 17th Street, and over here on Marietta to uh, Peachtree on this side. So all of that area, if there is a crime in that area, we put out a Cleary Alert. The ones that happened earlier this month, one happened at Burger King down at Hemp Hill and Northside. Uh, one happened over at the Varsity. They didn't involve our students, but we felt like we needed to alert our students of that. The two that were reported this morning actually was the same perpetrator, probably the same perpetrator, I guess can't be sure. Um, but we have uh, over 400 cameras on campus, uh, 400 cameras uh, that are monitored and will help us. I have no doubt that we will catch those perpetrators. Uh, we caught the ones from earlier, uh, in, earlier this summer, uh, have apprehended those individuals, we will catch these folks, but we're continuing to work to try to ensure that you have a safe and, and uh, uh, a campus that where you can walk around and be safe and that you can walk around the edges of campus and the areas surrounding campus. One crime is too many, uh, but we're working to try to improve that and address those issues. Uh, I should mention that last year we had 20 Clary Alerts. Of those 20 Clary Alerts, five of them were from on-campus events. So a lot of the activity that you see on the Clary reports actually occur in those boundaries outside the campus. Uh, we're going to continue to focus on people. As I kind of close here, but continue to work to attract, develop, and retain the very, very best faculty and staff we can. We do that with students. We need to do it with the people that work here at Georgia Tech. We've created a staff council, a group of 20 people. Uh, have been appointed to serve through December, and their task is really to help run the election for the permanent members or the elected members of the staff council. I was concerned when I came five and a half years ago that there were a large number of people at Georgia Tech that didn't have any formal representation. Uh, the students had representation through the vice president of student affairs to uh, the president's office. The faculty had representation through the faculty, uh, the general faculty and the executive board. Um, but there were a large number of staff that didn't have representation. So we did some adjustments on titles. We had to go through that process first. The faculty approved that, and we just established this staff council, which, which will ensure that every single person at Georgia Tech has representation in the issues that they think are important. A lot going on in terms of campus construction. Uh, you, uh, just in the past five years, we've opened the Marcus Nanotechnology Building uh, in terms of academic buildings, the Marcus Nanotechnology Building, the uh, Clough Undergraduate Learning Commons. We did a major renovation of, May, of Mason. Uh, um, C, C on the hill here. Um, Chapin. Chapin. The Chapin Building is undergoing renovation now. Um, and we've got uh, a number of athletic facilities, certainly the Brock, John and Mary Brock Indoor Practice Facility, the McCamish a basketball pavilion, the, the uh, Ken Byers Tennis Center, and there's work going on to improve the academic center in the Edge Building and upgrade the locker rooms and the stuff that's underneath the uh, Chandler Baseball Stadium. Probably the most aggressive project we have going on right now is the Engineered Biosystems Building. It's out on 10th Street. You can't miss it. It's up and out of the ground. We will be in that building and occupy that building within a year. This is the fifth building in this kind of bio quad, if you will. It's an area where it will house the biology department, but it will largely be populated with researchers and faculty from disciplines across engineering and across science, where they can come together, develop new technologies, new ideas, new inventions, new approaches to global health that can then transition from there, perhaps, to the ATDC in Tech Square, where startup companies can be formed, and then maybe to the uh, Technology Enterprise Park. Uh, where Cardio Mims, one of the companies that was started out of Georgia Tech and just recently sold for a whole lot of money. Um, uh, and uh, we're trying to continue to work with that. We're trying to develop these solutions to multifaceted challenges that impact the life of the citizens of the state of Georgia and around the world. Planned on the horizon, 
is the High Performance Computing Center. If you stand at the Georgia Tech Hotel and look across the street at the Scheller College of Business and the bookstore, there's a lot to the right. Um, that is 771 Spring Street, so we're standing here. Uh, this is the Scheller College of Business and the bookstores on the first floor, and this is the old front one-third of this Crum and Forrester building. We'll build a two or three-story data acquisition or data processing center and a large tower in the back. Georgia Tech will probably occupy about a third or half of that tower, much like we do in the Synergy building. The remainder will be partners that will partner with us to create this high-performance computing center. We think it will continue the transition of TechSquare in an area that's hugely important to us here at Georgia Tech and hugely important to the country. And that is, how do you take massive amounts of information and create useful knowledge out of that information. That's the type of activity that will take place in this facility. We will probably start construction in somewhere in 18 months to two years. This, the Board of Regents gave us some resources this past year for initial design, and we're in the process of designing and scoping that particular facility. Arts on campus. Uh, you've uh, seen the sculptures, I hope, on campus. Uh, we were able to keep eight of those. Uh, through some activities. Raphael Bross created a Council for the Arts. They put up some funds as a matching challenge and other individuals have put up funds. And, and so seven of the sculptures have gone, but eight of them still remain on campus. There are, uh, this is the crown out in front of the CRC. This one right here uh, used to be red. Uh, we repainted it. They repainted it yellow and now it's orange. Um, <laughs> but uh, this is adding a new dimension. And people ask me, why are we interested in the arts? Why is Georgia Tech pursuing the arts? We think that that is going to help foster the creativity in our students, to help build creativity and allow them to be more innovative and more creative. Just a couple of comments. Dr. Catherine Mur uh, Murray Rust is here. She's in charge of the uh, committee that's overseeing SACS, COC reaffirmation. So every 10 years, SACS comes in and reviews the institution. They do a midterm review after five years, but it's, our time is up, and you can see the schedule, or our time is, has come forward. You can see the schedule here of uh, when they will be here. The report is actually due in the next couple of weeks. Uh, there'll be uh, some evaluation of that and some review of that, and then the team will be visiting um, in March, and we'll hear next December. A very, very important part of this is the quality enhancement plan. We actually solicited input from the faculty. This QEP has to be a faculty generated initiative and we asked for proposals from the faculty and got several that were very good. Those proposals have been merged together and our QEP for this SACS uh, reaccreditation visit will focus on the combination of sustainability, experiential learning, and community engagement. To give you an idea of how that might impact Georgia Tech, the QEPs from the review 10 years ago we're focused on the international plan and study abroad and undergraduate research opportunities. And when you think about the dramatic increase in the number of students that are studying abroad and the number of students that are involved in undergraduate research, it gives you some idea of the potential impact of this focus on sustainability, community service, uh, and uh, community engagement and experiential learning. Just a word about the capital campaign. Campaign Georgia Tech, our goal was to raise $1.5 billion by, 20, or by uh, December 31st of 2015. Uh, we are at $1.45 billion now. We have $50 million to go. Part of that process was to create and endow 100 new chairs uh, and professorships. We are currently at 80, and we're working to try to reach that target. Just a word about the G. Wayne Clough Tech Promise program, this is a program whereby students whose family income is 150% of the federal poverty level or below can come to Georgia Tech for free if they're from the state of Georgia. We've had 600 students that have participated in that program. This year we'll have 240, 250. Their average family income is $21,000. It's changing the lives of these families. Our goal was to raise $50 million. We've raised $55 million for that endowment. It's something that you can be tremendously proud of. Um, we are one Georgia Tech she. Uh, <laughs> not sure what happened there. Uh, um, that, that's from our campus in France. Um, 
our strategic plan, in the strategic plan, one of the things we said was in the years ahead, we have to continue to enhance a culture of collegiality, close collaboration, and global perspective, intercultural sensibility, sensitivity and respect and thoughtful interactions among all the people at Georgia Tech. We're continuing to do that. This is a special place. People ask me what I like about Georgia Tech, what surprised me about Georgia Tech, and my response is almost always, the people that are associated with Georgia Tech love this institution. The alumni love it, the people that work here love it, and the students love going here. They don't always love it while they're here, but shortly after they leave, uh, they start to realize what a difference it's made in their life. It's a great place to work, and it's a great place to work because of all of you and what you do. So with that, I'll stop. Um, Actually, uh, since we are running very short on time and the last part of what you were going to do involves students who are sitting next to me very nervous about their noon exam. All right. So, uh, so let's go ahead and do that. We'll do, the next thing we'll do I'll is, turn it back over to you. Thank you. The next thing we'll do, I think most of you know that uh, Miss Georgia is from Georgia Tech, Miss Maggie Bridges. Maggie, you want to come up here? So in order, uh, so in the next couple weeks, Maggie's going to be competing in the Miss America Proud Project. Yeah, I leave on Monday. So. so one of the things that happens in the Miss America pageant is there's a competition that kind of starts it off, and it's called the Show Me Your Shoes Parade. Uh, and so the Miss America contestants show off uh, some special shoes that they have. Well, the folks here at Georgia Tech thought it would be pretty cool if some students got together and designed some special shoes. So we have uh, three students that are with us that participated in this. Um, they are Marin Sani, Marin is here, come on up. Uh, Jordan Thomas and Julia Brooks, uh, students. Uh, where's Jordan? I saw. So th they have worked with. <laughs> so, Matt. <laughs> So this is the first time that Maggie's actually seen these shoes. Uh, she kind of knew a little bit about them, but let me tell you something about them real quick. Uh, the bumpers and fenders were laser cut from acrylic heat molded to match. A honeycomb heel, so it's lightweight, custom designed. Handcrafted replicas of the flags molded with the headlights, 3D printed. The wheels were printed with heat molded acrylic, and the students designed these shoes. Thank you very much, and congratulations. Nice job. Nice. Great job. Great job. So I, I just want to do a small commercial. Uh, you can go online and vote uh, for the Miss America pageant at www.missamerica.org uh, forward slash vote. And you can vote that Maggie into the top 16. So good luck, Maggie. We'll be watching you on TV. Thanks, guys. So. I know you guys have to go to class, so head yes, out. You. you are welcome. You are welcome. Okay, we there is a class in here that starts at noon. Okay, it is Calc two, and there's an exam. So unless you want to take the exam, I have time for one question from the audience, and then I'm going to ask the president if you would please exit and stay out in the foyer here to answer your other questions one on one. I've got one question right here. You're the yes, lucky sir. lucky person. Sorry I went on and on and on. Uh, hi, I'm Jeremy Brown. I'm a fourth year CS student. Uh, I have an idea that I believe would benefit the Georgia Tech community. I created a prototype last semester that was well received and I want to have it officially adopted before I graduate. However, every attempt I have made to meet with tech officials has failed. This leads to my question, why is there no formal method for students to make pitches to improve the campus? And if there is, why is it not publicized? To make what? Pitches. 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 Like, oh, make pitches. Um, uh, 
I don't know the answer. Uh, I, I don't know that we have a formal mechanism. I'm not sure what kind of pitch you're talking about. If it's a, if it's a student activity or a student club, that would probably go through student affairs. If it has to do with facilities or uh, uh, access, those types of things probably through uh, the uh, facilities group. So I, I think it depends on what type of uh, activity or organization it is. If you have a specific idea, if you'll meet me outside, we can talk about it and I can point you in the right direction. Uh, but I, I don't know that we have a single point of contact for students who have ideas. Uh, we certainly have had students that have come forward with lots of ideas to me and to other people that have been directed. We've had a number of students that have had suggestions about how to improve the entrepreneurship and innovation activities for students. And we've directed those to Dr. Stephen Flem or Mr. Stephen Fleming. So maybe you and I can chat outside and uh, we'll talk about your idea. Sure. Again, sorry, if you've got questions, uh, there's a website where you can send them and we'll answer and respond to the questions that were sent electronically online. But thank you very much for being here. Wait too long.